Hello, everybody, and welcome back. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker for Clean Room Certification Digging Deeper. As a pharmacist surveyor for the Accreditation Commission for Healthcare, Ralph McBride has completed hundreds of surveys across the USA, focusing on home medical equipment, infusion pharmacy, infusion nursing, and specialty pharmacy. Ralph also works with the Accreditation University to help select clients understand and meet accreditation requirements. In the last 12 months, Ralph has completed his BCSCP and is an active participant on the CETA CAG008 task force. Ralph's complete bio can be found on the speakers tab in the left hand column, but let me say he is a wonderful speaker to work with and has an amazing voice. So please join me in welcoming for this presentation, Ralph McBride. Over to you, Ralph. Thank you, Heather. And as Heather said, my name is Ralph McBride and I am a pharmacist, pharmacy surveyor for the Accreditation Commission for Healthcare. And many of you know us simply as ACHC. In that role, I find myself in clean rooms across the United States frequently, and I'm there to judge uh, compliance of the room and the associated equipment with USP 797. So what I'll bring to you today are some experience and practical experience through those surveys. Many of you uh, know that in September of this year that USP uh, released a proposed revision to chapter 797. I think that release is a testament to USP's continued learning, uh, to continued efforts towards learning and a commitment to improvement for better outcomes. Well, the same thing exists in the clean room certification community. Uh, the certifying world is continuously evolving and our understanding of tests and techniques is improving. In today's presentation, there will be times when I may say that this test is often not done or missed, or there's controversy about this test. I am not trying to imply that a certifier is not doing a good job. I'm simply reiterating, reiterating the fact that we are evolving, and today I am presenting best practices. So as other speakers have done, I, am, uh, I have no uh, conflicts of interest, real or apparent, and certainly no financial interest to report to you. However, I, I do submit to you that I am uh, a member of the CETA Application Guide 008 Committee, and I'm a surveyor for ACHC. I want you to know that today I'm speaking on my individual capacity and my thoughts and, and uh, do not necessarily represent the views of CETA or ACHC. So what are we gonna to learn today? So the first thing I would like to, to, to make sure that we accomplish is that you leave today understanding exactly what USP 79 requires in regards to certification. You and I both know there's no simple chart in the current or the proposed version that helps guide us through that. So I've created a chart and uh, we will review that today. I'm also like to review with you the organizations that write, educate, train, and test certification techniques. We're gonna to try to untangle that alphabet soup and, and make those organizations more real for you. Then we're gonna identify areas of the secondary engineering control, the SEC, uh, the things that we have to certify and the things that also cause certification confusion. And then we will take a look at the primary engineering controls, the things that require certification and the things that, they, that create certification confusion. And lastly, I'm gonna talk about, so at the end of the certification, you're given a report. What are you gonna do with that report? And so we will cover that. Uh, as I was uh, preparing for today's talk, I wanted to make sure that we, we um, address the items in the fat part of the bell curve for sterile compounding. So uh, as you know, sterile compounding is, 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 is deep and wide. And so today I, I wanna talk about the things that I'm not gonna be covering. Uh, I, I will not be covering radio pharmaceuticals. I won't be covering uh, segregated compounding areas. Happy to answer questions about those. I'm not gonna be covering aseptic isolators, aseptic containment isolators. 
Uh, I don't plan on doing integrated vertical laminar flow zones, but I'm happy to answer questions. We're not going to talk about the low volume exemption for compounding HDs or the displacement airflow versus the use of an anteroom. So this is how I plan on moving forward. So we're going to talk about uh, to establish a good base of what are these things that USP requires and who are these organizations by the name of CEDA and NSF and IEST. Then we're going to talk about the secondary engineering controls. We're going to talk about the tests that must be performed in the areas of confusion. Uh, we're going to talk about the primary engineering controls. We're going to talk about the, the specific test in the areas of confusion. And then we're going to talk about, okay, I've got this report. What am I going to do with it? So let's jump right into what does USP 797 require in regards to certification? So the first thing I'll submit to you is that both the current chapter and the proposed 2021 proposed version both agree that your clean room uh, suite should be certified using a, the certifica certification guide for sterile compounding facilities, which is also known as CAG003. Now that is a CETA document. You'll notice that the 2021 language is identical except for it adds or an equivalent guideline. I will tell you that I am not familiar with such equivalent guideline today. So, uh, one of the first things I would suggest you take a note on is that if you've never read CAG003, I the next time your certification vendor comes in, I would review that document with them. Because remember, USP is saying you need to certify your room to those standards. Now, what are the tests that are specifically discussed within USP? So the first one is air changes per hour in your SEC, and both chapters agree that's important, and we're going to talk a lot more about air changes per hour. Both chapters also agree that they, you, the certifier has to perform tests and certify that your pressure differentials are according to what the chapter says they need to be. Certifier also needs to do a HEPA filter integrity test. Your certifier may call this a HEPA filter leak test. And please remember that's any HEPA filter and we'll talk some more about that. Your certifier has to do ISO classification in your SECs and your PECs. You may call this particle counting. Um, there is a really important thing about these, the, those two tests. Uh, and those are, if you'll notice the asterisks, those tests must be performed under dynamic operating conditions. And I will tell you, there's been great confusion about those words, dynamic operating, uh, operating conditions, and we are going to dig a little deeper later on about that. Both chapters also agree that the uh, compounding suite must be comfortable and well-lighted. And so let's just talk briefly. Comfortable, many of us have this number of, uh, of 68 degrees F or lower. The chapter really doesn't say that. The chapter says the room's got to be comfortable. So as a surveyor, one of the questions I'll ask your staff, and I'm sure boards of pharmacy do the same thing, is are you comfortable when, you, when you're in there performing your activities, whether it's cleaning or compounding? Uh, and so comfortable. The well-lighted one gets even more interesting. Um, the chapter says that the room, it says it must be well-lighted, but it never defines in that chapter what that means or where you measure it. Now, there is a USP chapter uh, that defines well-lighted uh, for a compounding, for compounding sterile products, but it never tells us where to, to measure that. So the certifiers that I work with will all say that, you know what, it's a great, it's a great thing, but we don't know where to get it. So a lot of people just don't measure that. I will tell you as, a, as an accreditor, uh, as a surveyor, what I'll do is when I enter a clean room, if all the lights are burning and it looks bright, then I, I think you've met that standard. If, if I walk into a clean room uh, and half of the lights have burned out and they need replacement, then yeah, that's probably a different story. Both chapters also agree that the air coming out of your PEC must be unidirectional, which means flowing in one direction, and it must be uniform. Now, this is really interesting. The air coming out of your PEC, uh, the, the chapter, USP 797, says it's got to be unidirectional, but nowhere in the chapter does it define uniformity. The word uniformity is actually in the definition of unidirectional airflow. So that's the reason I put unidirectional and uniformity on the same line here. Both chapters agree that you've got to do a dynamic smoke 
pattern test in your PEC. Uh, and we're going to we're going to see a picture of that. And, and that's one of those really cool tests that uh, you should really get involved in because it's good for educating staff. But this is one that's got to be done in dynamic operating conditions. Uh, the chapters agree that leadership must review the certification report to make sure your room is in compliance with all the requirements of the chapter. Uh, and so we're going to talk about a, a tool that can help with that. And the chapter also talks about uh, that items introduced into your classified space need to be disinfected. And so the current version basically says, you know what, let, let's use 70% sterile isopropyl alcohol, which I'll call SIPA going forward. Well, I, like, I actually like the 2000 proposed version because it says, you know what, you could use a spore saddle agent, an EPA registered disinfectant or sterile uh, or SIPA. Uh, you need to apply that with a low lint wipe with someone wearing gloves. Now, let's think about this. We know that our certification professional is going to bring lots of equipment in our room. And we know that that equipment's been in other facilities and it's been transported between the facility and their vehicle, in the back of their vehicle, and then, then into our establishment. So it seems to me there's lots of chance for contamination. So if I were uh, right doing an SOP, I would probably say, you know what, we're going to use a spore style agent. We're going to apply that in such a manner that it stays wet for the appropriate dwell time. And then uh, we will um, allow that in our classified area. Now, I realize that some people love charts like I do, and this is sufficient, but some people like to see sort of what's behind the curtain of the chart. So in today's supplemental reading, um, you'll see that I've included a document, what does USP require? And that will actually give you the language that supports each one of these yeses that I've put on the charts. All right, so let's, let's talk about some of the equipment that's gonna be introduced into our room. First, I want you to know that this is not to scale. Uh, so this first item here uh, is a, uh, what's called a capture hood. And a capture hood, just to put it in perspective, is about three foot tall, and this is about two foot cubed on top. So capture hood is a, is a large piece of equipment, and the blue part there is a fabric. So not only is it a lot of surface area to clean, but it's the difficult surface area to clean. This gadget right here is called electronic manometer. And this is what's going to be used to verify your differential pressures. I want you to notice on the scale here that that's three decimal places, and that's going to become important here shortly. This is a smoke generator. They'll use this little gadget to generate smoke to do the smoke testing. This is what's called a thermal anemometer. So this is the gadget that they're going to put in your PEC to test those uh, air flows. There's a particle counter that will be used for your ISO classification. And this is an aerosol photometer where they will actually do HEPA filter integrity testing. And besides the equipment on, th on this particular slide, there's others that I didn't incorporate into this slide, such as the gadget that generates the aerosol that this is measuring. The point of all of this is there's lots of stuff getting ready to be brought into your room. And you need to make sure that your SOP effectively manages that and so make sure, so take a note and make sure your SOP addresses how this equipment is going to be cleaned and disinfected. All right, so I promised we were gonna talk about uh, the term dynamic operating conditions. And I said there was lots of confusion and I'll tell you where I think that confusion started. Uh, when the original version of USB 797 was released, uh, the chapter was very clear. Uh, the ISO classification uh, had to be done under dynamic operating conditions. Uh, smoke studies for the PEC had to be done under dynamic operating conditions, at least the dynamic uh, smoke study does. But they never defined in the chapter what dynamic operating conditions are. Well, and I think one of the reasons is because the chapter said, hey, we're going to be certifying this room according to CETA CAGA03. And within that document, dynamic operating conditions are defined. So, and not many of us have a copy of that document. So let me tell you what the current definition is, and then I'll, talk, I'll tell you about where we're heading. So what, a, what, what dynamic operating conditions includes is that the conditions under which a certification, certification occurs, all actual operating personnel are present in performing actual simulated 
conditions. Now let's, let's look at this, operating personnel. So I hear often where people say, oh, don't worry, uh, versus our one compounder, the certifier was in the room. I'm here to tell you the certifier is not an operating personnel. They don't do the things that your compounding staff do. They don't generate the particles they do. So you need your operating personnel in the room and they need to be performing actual or simulated operations. Well, in the 2021 version uh, that just came out in September, they've used the same definition, uh, but they've added some really, I think, very effective clarifications. And what they've said is the conditions should reflect the largest number of personnel and the highest complexity of compounding. So let's break this apart. Let's say that you have a compounding room and on Wednesdays you try to batch TPN and on, on those days you've got two TPN compounders and you've got one compounder that's doing uh, immediate starts and also some chronic care therapies. So you've got three people in the room. Well, the way uh, dynamic operating conditions is, uh, when you're doing the ISO classification of that room, you need to have three personnel present and they need to be simulating, probably simulating, uh, um, the actual compounding. So I would expect two hoods to be simulating TPN compounding and one hood to be simulating other stuff. Now, um, let me let me just go back to that slide for a second. Um, some boards of pharmacy have really begun to understand this. And I'll give you an example. One of my certification colleagues that does certifications in Connecticut tells me that the Connecticut Board of Pharmacy will come into a pharmacy and the first thing they'll ask is, on your busiest day, how many, cert how many technicians do you have in your room? How many people are in there? And if they say three, they'll open up your certification report and they look for the room being certified with three people for things that are certified under dynamic operation, operating conditions, which we all know now are ISO classification and dynamic smokes pattern, pattern test. So make sure that you're in compliance with this, because if you're in Connecticut and you're not, then they will simply say this room hasn't been certified appropriately. So let's untangle some of this alphabet soup. So who is CETA? Apparently, they're pretty important because USP's recognized them, right? Well, CETA is a, uh, an organization that was actually founded by certifiers who wanted to develop quality assurance in the controlled environment testing uh, and there, uh, I want you to think of CETA as an aggregator of expertise. So they don't necessarily write the test uh, for all of the things that have to be certified, but they know where to get the test and they bring those in their, into their application guides. And so when you look at CAG003, it'll reference IEST, it'll reference ISO, lots of other organizations because they're pulling those standards into their application guide. Now, the other thing, CETA is a trainer of certifiers. Not only do they train them, but they will test their competence through their, uh, through their CETA National Testing Board. And they're very involved in the industry. So CETA will help other organizations actually uh, write those standards, and they also serve on the boards in many of those organizations. Uh, so the other cool thing about CETA is, other than ISO, they are the only other organization that's called out in the chapter. And, and we covered this earlier, but it, but, it, but it warrants mentioning again, the chapter, both current and proposed, both say that we're going to certify these rooms using the Certification Guide for Sterile Compounding Facilities, which we all know is known as CAG003. All right, so who's NSF? So if you have a class two biological safety cabinet, I can promise you that cabinet has been tested according to the detailed test procedures listed in NAS ANSI 49. Uh, and um, it's interesting about uh, uh, this particular organization. They're not directly referenced by USP in, in either chapter 797 or 800, but they're referenced extensively in CETA CAGs because remember CETA is pulling in those test procedures. And then IEST. So the Institute of Environmental Science and Technology is a nonprofit member organization uh, that provides technical guidance through international standards and recommended practices. Now I wanna key in on this recommended practices. Um, and um, just for an example, uh, when you go to test a HEPA filter for leaks, uh, the standard that you use is IEST RP uh, 34.4. Uh, 
So the IEST stands for Institute of Environmental Science and Technology. RP is that's a recommended practice and it's practice 34.4. Now, I will tell you that IEST has minimal reference in, eight, in, in chapter 800 and 797, and it's not mentioned at all in the, in the new proposed version. But as you already know, it's mentioned extensively in the CAGs through CETA. All right, so let's talk about the actual things that the certifier has to certify while they're on site. Um, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is air changes per hour. So a simple definition of that, it's the number of times per hour that air in the classified space is HEPA filtered. So in, in, in this particular air change per hour, I want you to think of it as a tool to achieve and maintain a state of bio burden control. If you talk with your uh, certification professional, they will tell you most likely that in, in clean room suites where they have a higher air change per hour, they will say that their bio burden identified environmental monitoring is much less. So, um, and, and we're gonna talk in just a minute where that uh, will be helpful. Um, the other thing that air there changes, it is integral to the ISO classification of your space. So let's make that real for you. So you, you, you and I know that if we have a buffer room, uh, that buffer room has to be at least ISO seven. And we also know that it needs to have 30 air changes. Well, the chapter goes on to say that only 15 of those have to come from the room. So the other 15 can be supplemented by some other HEPA filtering device. And usually that is a, um, a PEC in the room running uh, that, that ge generates enough air changes where it can make up the difference or PECs. Um, the same in your ante room, ante rooms or, or gowning rooms um, that don't uh, service an HD compounding room. Uh, can be ISO 8 or better, requires at least 20, and 15 of those come from the room. So you can make up five with some other HEPA filtration device. Now, I just want you to remember that if you have a room that's, that's low on air changes and you have a biological uh, class 2 biological safety cabinet, a CPEC, you can't, you can't contribute those air changes uh, to help you with that because remember the air that's filtered here is actually exhausted out the room, so it doesn't help the room. All right, so let's dig a little deeper on this air change per hour thing. So we all know that ante rooms that don't uh, serve an HD compounding room can be, can be ISO 8. We now know that ISO 8 requires 20 air changes, right? And I want you to think about what happens in that ante or gowning room. That's where the dirtiest processes are occurring uh, for your clean room suite. It's where you're gowning, it's where you're doing hand hygiene, most likely, and it's where you're, you're most likely the first step at getting materials into the clean room. So um, is 20 air changes the right number? And it is of my opinion that it's not. I think that number should be two or three X that number. So if you're designing a clean room, uh, I would certainly not design it at 20. Now, if you're designing a clean room and your engineer asks you, for the minimum specifications. Often you'll tell them it's 20 for ISO 8 and, and 30 for ISO 7. And so what an engineer will wanna do is they wanna add 10% to it uh, and, and, and call it a day. Well, I'm, I would like to tell you that that's not the right practice because we all know that these filters will load over time. And because of that, yes, they will become more efficient at filtration, but they'll also decrease the air change. So all of a sudden, into the near future, you would be below your minimum filtration uh, from those filters. So you don't want that. So try to avoid that. Um, if there's anything that you get out of today's talk, it would be the next point. That is, if you're designing a room, uh, please make sure that you install filter units uh, that have a room side removable filter and motors. The last thing I want you to do is have to penetrate the ceiling on a clean room and because there's things up there that I just don't want to get into the room. Um, and I want you to be able to do that from the room side. All right, so let's talk a little bit about differential pressures. So um, the first thing is, uh, this is just simply a tool to keep air in its place. So what we're trying to minimize is a lower quality air going into a room with higher quality air. So 
And when we're talking about the ante room, we're protecting the ante room from the general pharmacy area. And when we're talking about the buffer room, we're talking about protecting the buffer room from air from the ante room coming in. Uh, these measurements are normally in inches of water column, but you will see pascals, which is a European measure. Uh, and you'll see that some pharmacies measured in that. And um, so 0.02 inches, usually it's, it's about five pascals. Now on this slide, I've provided uh, two gauges for you. And so you can see on this gauge where it's very easy to read uh, this pressure to three decimal points. On the analog gauge up here, although it's possible, it's difficult. And that's, a, that's gonna become important here in the near future. And we'll talk about that soon. All right, so let's talk about what are the requirements of this differential pressure stuff. So the first thing is it's continuous. It's not just during compounding. Uh, I have been in pharmacies where uh, they uh, have a night setback. And so at night they turn all the fans off and, and let the pressures go to neutral. And you may ask, well, why didn't the certification company catch that? Because they're looking at the conditions when they arrive. Um, as an accreditor, often we're asking different questions and we can, we can find things like that and help the uh, uh, client improve. So remember, differential pressures are continuous, not just during compounding, not just during the day. Uh, and the reason is we're trying to keep those quality of air separated. Uh, the next thing is we all know that as long as it's a non-hazardous classified area, well, we're going to we're going to re require at least uh, 0.02 inches water column positive to the connecting room. Now that word connecting room is an interesting one because really what it really behind the scenes what that means is two rooms connected with a door. Oftentimes you've got a room that has a pass through. Uh, that sort of gives you a connection. But when I use the word connecting room, think of a room connecting another with a door. And lastly, we, we all know uh, that if it's a hazard classified room, then that room requires a negative pressure. Uh, and the reason is we want to keep what's in that room in that room, and we do not want that HD spreading in the facility. So now I want to dig a little deeper and, and, and talk about uh, some opportunities. Uh, the first thing is, uh, you should you should take a look at your certification report and see if your vendor has been performance verifying your gauges. CAG03 uh, it makes it very clear that gauges must be performance verified at every certification. So if you're not doing that, th then we need to do it. Uh, the second thing is, uh, please, please, please label your gauges to include the reference point. So let me give you an example. Um, we know that if we measure the ante room, what we're really measuring is the ante room pressure compared to the general pharmacy area. And that, so this would be higher pressure, lower pressure. So now I know the differential between these two rooms. But if you just had a gauge that was labeled with ante, I have no idea what, what, the, what the reference point is. So please put both names on your gauge. The other thing is, I want you to uh, think about resolution for a second. So in the current version of 797 and in the current version of 800, they both express these uh, differential pressures in two decimal points. But in the new version of 797, the proposed version, they've now changed that to three. And I'll tell you what, what drove that. As I'm talking with my certification uh, uh, colleagues, what was happening is in, what was happening is in, in a number of clients um, uh, pharmacies, uh, that electronic manometer that I showed you early with three decimal places would say the differential pressure was 0.016. And the pharmacy would say, oh, it's clearly that rounds up to 0.02. So this is, uh, I think, a wise thing to get away from this rounding argument and say the pressure is what the pressure is. So uh, what I would like for you to take away from that is take a look at your, your gauges. If your gauges can be read in three decimal points, great. If they can't, then maybe it's something you put on your budget uh, for the future. All right. So here's an example of a typical pharmacy. And we've got our general pharmacy area here. You enter into your ante room, do your stuff, then enter into your buffer room. Now, uh, to understand how this differential pressure stuff works, I need to show you this schematic of a typical pressure gauge. So pressure gauges have two ports. There's a high pressure port and a low pressure port. And so just think about it. If we were gonna measure the pressure differential of these two rooms, 
I would want my high pressure port here in this room, and I would want my low pressure point here. And so the gauge is going to show tell me the difference in the pressure, i.e. the pressure differential. Well, if I want the, the so, and, and that's appropriate because that's the connecting room, right? Well, the connecting room for the buffer room would be the ante room. So we want the differential pressure between the buffer room and the ante room. So how do we how do we plumb this? High pressure in this room, low pressure in this room. You can put the gauge anywhere, and we're looking for the differential between the two. But I have visited a number of pharmacies where when they plumbed it, high pressure, low, high pressure, low. So the both reference ports ports were in the general pharmacy area. And so when we're looking at the pressures, they've got 0.02, 0.02. So they say, okay, we meet that, but you don't meet that. Because remember, 0.02 has to be relative to the adjoining room, the adjacent room, the connecting room through a door. And if this is 0.02 relative to this room, and this is 0.02 relative to this room, then these rooms are actually equal. So think about that. I'm happy to answer some questions for you, but what do you do if you've got yours plumbed like that? What if you inadvertently plumbed your low pressure ports for both gauges into this room? What you could do is simply say that an acceptable va value for this room is that it always reads 0.02 greater than the reading for over here. So in the case where both gauges have their low pressure tube over here in the general pharmacy area, Let's assume for a second that this room is reading 0.03. That meets it, right? Because it's 0 0.03 higher than this room. Well, for this room to pass, it would have to be reading 0 0.05 at least. So I hope that makes sense to you. All right, so let's talk about a, a, a HEPA filter integrity test, also it's called a leak test. I think uh, we would all agree that the HEPA filters are one of the lifebloods uh, of the, uh, the clean room suite. Uh, and, um, Testing those for leaks is paramount. And we do it with an aerosol challenge. And this chart will show you the challenges that have been used for HEPA filter testing. Uh, there are two in life sciences. PAO has been used and DOP. But I'm, he I'm here to let you know that DOP is a phthalate that's been linked to cancer. And so almost no certifying companies using this now. So one thing you could put in your notes is, Check your certification report to make sure your certifier is not using DOP and make sure they're using PAO, which stands for poly alpha olefin. And what we do with this, guys, is we simply add aerosol above the filter and then we, we, we test below the filter for any leaks. And a leak is uh, determined to be a leak is when you get greater than 0.01% of the upstream concentration. And we're, we're going to show you some schematics of that in a minute to make it real for you. So this is a picture of somebody leak testing. This is the uh, aerosol photometer. And uh, in the IEST guideline for this, um, uh, they have to, there's a certain scan rate that they, they're allowed to go and they have to have overlapping strokes and they have to cover the entire face of the filter. Uh, so that filter has to be leak tested at the factory. And then it has to be leak tested again upon installation. And so you're like, w why is that? Let's talk about what the filter is. It's three components, really. It's the filter medium, it's the gasket, and the housing. And so I can promise you at the factory, after that thing was tested, there were some people who gently put it in a carton and gently put it in the stock. And then somebody gently pulled it off a shelf and gently put it in a common carrier who, oh, I'm, I know when it went through the sorting factory, it was gently uh, handled and then finally arrives in your pharmacy to be installed. Well, because of all that gentle uh, handling, uh, certainly after it gets installed, we need to test it again to make sure we didn't uh, uh, damage the filter medium, crack the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the gasket or crack the housing. Now, it also has to be leak tested at every certification. And I'll tell you, that was, was a lot of confusion about that a couple of years ago, but hopefully people are straight on that now. So let's talk about HEPA filters in our clean room suite. So are they just in the ceiling? No, they're, they're, we've got lots of them. So um, we've got ceiling mounted HEPA filters. We've got HEPA filters in our PEC uh, uh, workbenches. 
We've got them in our CPEC supply HEPA filters. Many CPEC have them in their exhaust. And if you've got a HEPA filter at pass through, you've got them. And so please know that all any HEPA filter in the clean room suite has to be tested in installation and then with every certification. All right, so um, exactly how does this test work? Well, I, there is a there is one there is a certification vendor that does a really good job of explaining this test. And so, if you go to this short URL, you can get there. Or if you with your camera, you can just take a snapshot of that QR code and it'll take you right to the website. But they they will explain that test. We're going to take a look at it now. And so, this is what the filter looks like above your ceiling. And this is what it looks like below your ceiling. And so in general, what happens is we, um, we instill above your filter an aerosol. And remember the aerosol that should be used is PAO, poly alpha, alpha olefin. And it's, it's, it's uh, introduced here so that it will disperse over the entire filter medium. And then we scan the bottom of this, just like we saw in this depiction here, scan that and we're looking for any aerosol that made it through the filter. Now, this is sort of a Goldilocks uh, process. And the reason I say that is the target concentration up here is 10 to 90. And so you're wondering like, why the two numbers? The lower number was when this standard was put in place, uh, the aerosol photometers had a sensitivity that required you know, a certain concentration. So this was to make sure they could pick it up. Now, newer, newer uh, photometers, I'm told, have more sensitivity, but this is where we're at right now. And if you use too much, you would actually foul the filter and shorten the life. So one of the takeaways I'd like for you to do is take a look at your certification report and just see what concentration they've arrived at. Make sure they're doing this between 10 and 90. If you're doing too high of a concentration, then your filters, the, the life of your filters may be... Um, uh, shorter than they should be. All right, so this is uh, one of the areas where there's lots of uh, discussion and some confusion in the industry. And that is, well, um, let, let's, let's go back over to this. So if I, inst if, I, if I put a known amount of aerosol here, and I know the airflow of this, can I just calculate what should be above the filter? And the answer is yes. If you know how much aerosol uh, was given to the filter and you know the airflow of the filter, you can do that. This is where the confusion comes in. Let's assume for a second, this is your clean room. And your clean room has an air handling unit, a main duct, and 13 HEPA filters. So let's just say you've got a hard ceiling in here, no challenge ports in the filters. So the, uh, the certifier is either going to introduce the aerosol in the duct or in the air handling unit. So let's just say they introduce it over here to the air handling unit. My question for you is, how do you know, not assume, but how do you know that this filter has the exact same amount of aerosol as this filter? And the answer is, without testing, you don't. So this is a perfect example of when you are not allowed to calculate the concentration above the filter. Remember, if you put a known amount above a filter and you know the flow of the filter, then you can calculate the amount over that filter. You just can't do that for a bunch of filters like this because you don't know how much gets to each filter. All right, so let's dig a little deeper on this one. So if, uh, if you have some older HEPA filters that have been installed, they don't have challenge ports on them, what do you do? Well, uh, there is an aftermarket remote challenge port system that's available. And there are at least three different systems on the market. And this is sort of a representative of what they all do. They all have this dispersion tube here. And that dispersion tube is placed above the filter so that it will disperse the aerosol over the, over the face of the filter. Uh, this introduction port is normally placed, uh, let's take a look at one of these filters here. It's normally placed either near the filter or in a different room so that you could inject the aerosol here and it's gonna travel via that tube through the dispersion tube and then you can test down here. Okay, and then, um, so 
you're wondering, well, if there are three on the market, which one do I use? And are, you know, first of all, this isn't really high tech stuff, but there is some science about the diameter of the tubing and the diameter of these orifices so the aerosol doesn't rain out. Uh, so what I recommend is that you work with your certifier to select the right port system. Now, where you put this introduction port is uh, some art and some science. Let's look at this, Pat, let's look at this here. So if we put it here, which a lot of pharmacies do, and the certifier is introducing the aerosol here, if there is a leak at the junction of the aerosol generator and that port, then as you scan this, you could get a false uh, leak test for this filter. So some uh, certifiers want to put that port in a different room. So my point is work with your certifier to determine which works best for you. All right, so we're going to talk just a little more about this uh, HEPA filter leak test. Uh, twice in the last year, and I just read about another example last night, uh, there are pharmacies uh, that upon certification, they had a ceiling mounted HEPA filter that had a leak that could not be patched. And so their final report was the room couldn't be certified. And you, you and I know what that means is you have a BUD that's unsustainable. So what do I recommend? I recommend two things. One is uh, an extra HEPA filter is not uh, prohibitively expensive. So I would get one extra HEPA filter. I would place it in a secure storage where it won't get damaged. And that way, if I have, a, I have one of my ceiling mounted HEPA filters that is, uh, that's damaged and can't be uh, patched, then it could be replaced by the certifier the same day. Uh, the other thing is I'm just gonna remind you is that small leaks in any HEPA filter can be patched and they can be patched up to 3% of the face of the filter. Uh, we do limit the repair width to no more than an inch and a half wide, but you can go, the length of that can be what it needs to be as long as you don't exceed 3% of the face. So the takeaways here are keep an extra filter on hand and, and make sure that it's been patched if it can. So um, that's a lot of information. What can you make sure is on your certification report so all this, uh, you can make sure all this is right? Well, the committee that I set on CAG 008, uh, and, and I will tell you that there will be a 2021 version of that coming out uh, in the near future. Uh, but this information really hasn't changed. So what you should require of the certifier is that they tell you where they introduce the aerosol, what the upstream measurement uh, location is, what was the concentration measured? Because remember, you're comparing that to what's below the filter. Did they measure or calculate this? They need to give you a diagram of all the filters with any indications of leaks or previous patches. And they need to tell you if it passed or failed. So uh, take note of this, look at your report and see if your report has this information. Now you may wanna, you may ask, well, Ralph, they don't say whether they, they calculate it or uh, if they measured it. So what do I do? I'll tell you how you can figure that out. So let's go back to this schematic here a second. Let's say that you get the report for all 13 of these filters. And on the uh, HEPA filter leak test, they have the same concentration for every filter. Well, I'll tell you, if, they, if you have that, then they calculated this and they, they introduced it somewhere over here, which we, all, we, we already know is not appropriate. So in that case, you know they did a calculation. And that's, uh, that's an opportunity to have a discussion with your certifier. All right, so let's, let's change to the next test and that is ISO classification. So remember ISO is one of the two organizations that's actually mentioned in the chapter. And um, basically we all know that uh, our PEC has to be ISO five or better. The buffer room has to be ISO seven or better. And, or, and the ante room can be seven or eight or better depending on what, what is connected to. What I want you to know about this is remember that ISO classification has to be done under the dynamic operating conditions. And so uh, when you um, have this test done, make absolutely sure that your certifier documents on the report. I recommend not just the number of people, but the names of the individuals and they should say what they were doing. Because if you reflect back on the definition of dynamic operating conditions, it talks about the maximum number of people, 
doing actual simulated compounding and it's the normal things that they do. So make sure your report uh, states that. The other thing I want you to learn from this is that, uh, let's say that you have an anti room that comes back with an ISO classification of six, which is, which is possible. Uh, and um, so uh, do you have to keep it at six? And the answer is no. You can look at the certifier and say, I want that to actually certify it as an eight. And the reason you might want to do that is remember ISO levels determine your action alert levels within environmental monitoring. So uh, remember that you have the power to do that. You just can't go the opposite direction. It can't come back with an ISO of uh, eight and you want it to be a seven. So you can only go the other direction. All right, let's talk about airflow in the PEC. So um, uh, the air in the PEC needs to be moving in a single direction in a uniform manner, and it needs to do that in such a velocity that sweeps particles away from the DCA. Uh, and so the principles here are that we've got sufficient flow to sweep those particles away, and that flow is going one direction, and that airflow is uniform. Now, I wanna talk about this uniformity thing a second. Uh, um, let's just assume for a second that we measure all the airflow in this PEC, and the airflow on this side is 150 and the airflow over here is 50. The average is going to be 100. And well, I can tell you 100 is exactly where um, CETA would accept. The problem is it's not uniform. And, and certainly we don't want 150 over here and 50. So uniformity is generally plus or minus 15 to 20 percent, unless the PEC vendor says something else. So I would suggest that you check your report and see if you guys have not only a velocity, but also uniformity. Uh, being reported. Uh, the thing about uh, uniformity is, um, uh, well, let's, let's talk about what CETA requires. So if the manufacturer doesn't specify, then the velocity is normally 80 to 100 feet per minute, unless dictated by otherwise by the manufacturer. Now you can use an alternative number, but it needs to be supported by smoke studies, basically saying, yeah, that number still gives us unidirectional flow um, that's uniform. And I was actually at a pharmacy the other day where it had much lower numbers, but the manufacturer supported it and so did the smoke studies. Now, I want you to think about this. At 80 to 100 feet per minute, that's equivalent to about a mile per hour. So we're not, we're not cr crushing it going up the highway here. So if you think about it, if you move that PEC within your compounding room, uh, you could influence that unidirectional airflow. So that's one of the reasons in the current chapter, it says if you're going to move it, it needs to be done in conjunction with certification. All right, um, let me just go back one other thing. I will, I will say that that uniformity standard that we talked about is often missed by certifiers. So please check your report to see if you've got that. All right, here's a really cool test. It's the uh, dynamic smoke study test, also called air visualization test. Uh, remember, it's got to be done in dynamic, dynamic conditions, which means you got the right number of people and they're simulating actual things that they do in the hood. So what happens here is we introduce a smoke. You can see here the smoke stick and here's the smoke coming off of it. Uh, and that smoke has to be neutrally buoyant. And think about that. If you use a smoke that's really heavy, it's going to go to the bottom here and not tell you anything. Or if it's too light, it's going to go to the top. So you need something that's neutrally buoyant. All right. And the purpose of this test is to really observe air patterns so that we can make sure we understand where the direct compounding area is. So the purpose includes figuring out the optimal layout for that dynamic, that direct compounding area. So let's assume for a second you got a TPN hood. In that hood, you've got this massive automated compounding device. So the question becomes, where's the right place to compound? And that's what the smoke study will help you determine. Uh, it will also help you educate staff on the impact of devices and hand placement. So if you go back here, uh, one of the things is hand placement here, that the compounder can see in real time uh, if, they, if they're blocking first air. And it's going to confirm if the PEC is uh, doing its job for the intended purpose. So is that the right PEC with the ACD to do TP and compounding? So please remember that this test has to be performed with actual compounding personnel performing simulations or actual uh, compounding processes. 
Uh, certainly, I would do simulations here because you're using a non-sterile smoke. So let's dig just a little deeper on this one. So um, I said that this is a great educational tool. There's no reason you have to wait for the certification company to come and do this for you. You can do your own smoke studies. And so I've, I've attached a document in the uh, supplemental readings that tells you how to build your own speaks, your smoke study. Okay, so I would suggest that you take a look at your certification report. And because this is one of those areas that, that we find um, uh, that, that could use uh, some enhancements at times. Uh, I, I want to make sure that the certifier describes the smoke. And they should use words like sweeping, smooth, steady, lazy, backward. We're trying to just get a feel for what they're observing. Um, we want a, a pass or a fail, but I will tell you that some certifiers uh, push back on that. Uh, but remember, this is your certification and you need to let them know what you require. Um, although a video recording is not required in all states, it is certainly something that I suggest you do. Because remember, a video recording becomes an, an absolute... Uh, great tool for staff education. And then the last thing is, let's make sure uh, that uh, they define the DCA uh, in their final report. Uh, remember, non-sterile substance is being used, so your SOP needs to address the cleaning after this. Okay, here's a, a little test called backstreaming and induction. Uh, and um, it's not specifically spelled out in USP. So if you're scratching your head, wondering why I didn't include it in that chart, it's because USP doesn't address it, but it is in CAG. And remember, USP says that we're gonna certify the room to CAG, which is why I've included this. And so what is induction? Induction is looking, testing all the joints, the construction joints of the hood to make sure it's not uh, allowing uh, th these less uh, quality air into a higher quality air environment. And then backstreaming is basically, is, is the smoke that we're introducing in the front being pulled into the hood. Now, this, this is the shortest test that's described in CAG. It's less than 40 words, and it's often not performed by certifiers. So you may wanna take a look and see if yours is doing that. Uh, as with other smoke studies, uh, this one potentially in, introduces smoke inside your hood, certainly does outside the hood, so your SOP needs to address cleaning. All right, so now let's talk about the actual report that you're gonna get. Uh, so uh, you're gonna be handed a report uh, or emailed a report from the certification company. And USP is very clear that you are to review that report and you are to make sure that report says that you're in compliance with all parts of the chapter. So that is a pretty tall order knowing that USP didn't give us a, a list of things that must be covered. So what we at ACHC have done is we've created this certification review and summary report. And this report will walk you through all the things that you need to make sure that are present. Uh, you can find a copy of this document in the supplemental readings um, uh, for this presentation. Now, lastly, um, it's, it's become clear to me recently that in the absence of a partnership agreement, with your certification company, then we haven't set both entities up for success. So if you don't have a partnership agreement, some people call these quality agreements, uh, you can call it whatever you want, uh, but, but the, the gist of it is we need to set the game, uh, the rules um, up front. And so the first thing is, what time of day will you show up? And let me tell you why that's important. Because one of the first tests that certification companies do is the ISO classification. And they do that because they know that once they drag all their equipment in the room, they're influencing uh, the ISO classification. So they wanna get that out of the way. Well, your people need to be there. And so often they'll wanna come before your staff starts. And now that you know the definition of dynamic operating conditions, you know that's not possible. So you need to, you need to upfront agree what time of day you're gonna start. And then what SOPs are you gonna use, uh, Mr. and Ms. Certifier for gowning, garbing, hand hygiene, and cleaning and disinfecting? And certainly I would make them use the chemicals uh, that are approved in, in your process as your SOPs. And then what are the list of tests that you will perform? Uh, remember I said, this is often a test that's missed or this is a test that's in a disagreement. Well, let's go ahead and say upfront what you will and will not do. Let's make sure they understand the number of staff that need to be present 
we know what's our maximum staffing level, so let's just put it in the agreement. And we need to say that they're required to be doing X, Y, and Z. Uh, the protocol for handling uh, non-compliance, we need to define if you find something that's not in compliance with our room, who do you notify and when, do you, when does that notification? And certainly you want them before they leave that facility to let you know because there may be a remedy while they're on site. And then make sure there's agreed upon certification report format and timeliness. So if you don't have one of these agreements, I strongly urge you to create one. All right, so this is my contact information if you should uh, have a question. Uh, and uh, the good thing is your claim code for CEs for today is CLEAN, C-L-E-A-N. All right, so Heather. Hi, Ralph. That was amazing. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. We did get a question in the chat from one of our attendees. Uh, Kevin Hansen's asking, what recommendations do you have for a chiller HVAC system that can maintain, quote, comfortable temperatures for HD buffer rooms? It's often a challenge and seems that many clean rooms are built with inadequate chilling abilities while maintaining other variables like humidity, ACPH, and et cetera. You know, Kevin, that's a really good question. And I will tell you, uh, if you're experiencing opportunities with temperature, uh, I first want to say you're not alone uh, and that you have a, a lot of colleagues out here. But, but let's let's revisit what the chapter says we must do. So let's break this down into temperature and humidity. Uh, so the temperature is, remember, it's uh, the, the chapter says it must be comfortable. And that's usually 68 or less. So it really it depends on what your staff is is comfortable with and what your policy says. If your policy says we will keep it at 68, then you have to keep it at 68. Um, so now let's talk about humidity. Humidity is a recommendation in the chapter. It's not a requirement. Uh, but uh, I am a believer that temperature and humidity are ingredients for growth in the room. So we need to manage both. Um, uh, it sounds like uh, there needs to be some further discussions with plan ops and uh, some other people to get you to where you need to be. I will tell you that temperature temperatures tend to be more difficult in um, HD compounding rooms. And probably the reason is you're exhausting so much of that air through the, uh, the BSC. So uh, I, I wish you well with that. Uh, it's going to be an interesting conversation. Wonderful. Thank you.